Welcome to Dr. Roger and Friends, the bright side of longevity, hosted by three peas in a podcast, Doc Roger, Teresa, and Danielle. Thanks for joining us for Coffee and Conversation. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm here with my esteemed colleagues, Teresa and Danielle. Hello, ladies. Hi there. Happy holidays. So I see you both have red on. Part of the season, right? It's the season to be jolly. But, you know, today we want to discuss what happens after that. You know, the New Year's thing, the New Year's resolution thing. We all kind of get trapped in. Let me ask this question. You know, I've asked this many times on um, presentation. So who here is, uh, which one of you are still doing something you made a New Year's resolution to do? Yeah, they see both hands go up because I know both of you, you're very disciplined and you know about the topic we're going to share today about Kaizen and the way to be successful, the way to not fail in something you want to do with lifestyle change. So I'm not surprised with you two. Well, you're going to have more to share, but if you would allow me, uh, I'm just going to pontificate for a minute here because uh, you know this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and then I'd like you both to weigh in. So why do we fail at New Year's resolutions? Well, the fact is, is that our brain uh, is programmed to do that. Uh, there's part of our brain called a fear center that is there to keep us alive. And whenever we're facing uh, a, a challenge, that usually kicks in with some fear and it drives a lot of other things. But when we take on something that's too big, uh, either from the outside or, or we decide to, this amygdala part of the brain fires and it basically shuts off many of the functions that we need to succeed in our New Year's resolutions. It's uh, kind of counterintuitive, but that's what happens. So what do you do about this? Um, well, uh, it's well known that, uh, and because we've talked about it many times, and so if you listen to this podcast, you've heard it many times, that the Japanese have an approach to this uh, called Kaizen, K-A-I-Z-E-N, which basically is change in small steps because then this amygdala doesn't fire and uh, we're more likely to be successful. So first of all, as we start the new year, okay, you wanna change some things, but don't start from a position of self-loathing, you know, or disgusted with yourself. Uh, start from a point of view that I wanna grow. In order to be healthy and have a healthy longevity, I need to grow. And so I'm gonna grow. And that's, it's a new year's growth commitment. How's that? And um, then, the way Kaizen works is that uh, it is, uh, it's, it's about small steps to a big goal. So first of all, you ask yourself, why? Why do I want to change? What is the reason? So for example, let's take weight. Okay, I want to lose weight. Why do you want to lose weight? Well, I want to be thinner. Why do you want to be thinner? If you're younger, maybe it's to get more dates, you know, uh, or you just don't like the way you look, or you're getting unhealthy, or you, you have pre-diabetes, or you want to have a healthy longevity. What is the reason? You should drill it down because it does make a difference uh, as you uh, go through the process of change to be reminded why. And so what is it you want to change? Okay, so with weight, you know, what does your doc say is a, is a good weight for you? What do you want to achieve? It should be realistic. And so that's the big up there goal, okay? But that's not the one you shoot for. That's usually what you shoot for in a New Year's resolution that you fail by February to meet. But that's just sort of a, a general over the horizon type goal. What you do is you ask yourself, what is the smallest thing, the smallest thing? that I can do to work towards the horizon there, to work towards what I want to achieve. And this is why, and this is what I want to achieve. And what's the smallest step I can take? And then you make that your goal. That's your goal. So I had this patient, Tony, you've probably heard me tell the story that he was a, a heart attack ready to happen. He was overweight, he was pre-diabetic, he was sedentary. He uh, had high blood pressure and, he, you know, he was just, he was not going to do well. 
So lots of attempts to change, and he he tried, but then he'd fail, and he'd recidivate and go back to where he was. So having found out about Kaizen, writing my book, uh, I said, Tony, how about this next week? All you do is stand during TV commercials. And boy, he did that. He really felt good about that. And then I said, okay, now walk in place. And he says, really, that's all? I say, yeah, that's all. And so he did that. And so he was, he, over the weeks, he got a sense of uh, self-esteem and self-confidence, self-efficacy, we can call it, that he could do this. And occasionally we'd uh, make a a goal, a small goal that was, he didn't make. And we said, oh, Tony, we just did too much. Just ratchet it back a little bit. And so he patiently progressed over a year and, you know, off all meds, normal blood pressure, no more prediabetes. And he has an active lifestyle, you know, not crazy. He just walks quite a bit, walks about 20 miles a week uh, on purpose. And then his lifestyle, he parks further away, takes stairs, all of those things uh, he does. So uh, he did it in small steps. So he asked himself, we together, why? And what did he want? He wanted to stay healthy and live to see his grandchildren and to see his daughter get married, uh, and then grandchildren, uh, and what it was, uh, he, and we discussed what was the smallest thing he can do. And so the next thing you do after you say, what's the smallest thing I can do? Well, then set that as a goal and imagine yourself doing it. It's almost like these athletes who say they imagine like a diver imagines themselves going through the dive as they get out on the board, sort of programming your head to do it and seeing success. And then when you reach it, what's the next goal? So really what we're talking about, say, if you want a New Year's resolution, know in general why you want to change or what you want to change, and then realize that you're going to have, let's just say, 52 commitments, one a week, one, a commitment to do something. You can call it a goal, but it's a small thing, a small step. And you the 52 of them, and maybe you won't make one. And so you ratcheted it back and then you make it. So at the end of that time, you're going to be quite a place. Uh, we once had a lady uh, talk to us and said, if, if you're walking in a direction and you change your direction by one degree on the compass, eventually you're going to end up quite a ways from where you would have been had you not made that small change. And that's an excellent, excellent analogy and metaphor for what we're trying to achieve with Kaizen, isn't it? I mean, you can do this. And in this way, you cannot fail, really, if you're realistic and patient. You, you really cannot fail, can you? Well, thank you for letting me get on the soapbox like that, ladies. Um, uh, I know people are much more anxious to hear what you folks have to say, what you two have to say, because you say it so well, and uh, sometimes you're a little more uh, realistic and humane than me, but uh, in any case, and you're both coaches, certified coaches, so you know exactly uh, how to deal with this as you do with it every day. So thank you for letting me go off like that. So Danielle, what do you think? So Roger, we like when you pontificate. (laughs) And I do have some thoughts on the subject, kind of uh, springboarding off of your talk on Kaitsen. You know, I think it's important to note too, that change can be more than just what we think of with a New Year's resolution, like a tangible something we don't want, like we want to quit smoking or we want to lose weight versus something we do want, like exercise three times a week and write a book. But there's also mindset. You know, I want to be kinder, or maybe I want to not stress so much, or I want to be more intentional with time, or maybe I want to be more flexible and not so rigid. So we can look at change in, in a few different ways. Is that yeah, your- it's, such a, it's such a good point, Danielle. We often want, we think about what we want to do, but you raised such a good point. How do we want to be? Yeah. So I I won't go too into too much detail about the trans theoretical model of change, because I don't want to put our listeners to sleep. Uh, But in general, you have your pre-contemplation and your contemplation state, which is the, you haven't taken action. You're thinking about taking action. It might happen in the next six months. It might not. We're kind of talking about as we go into the new year and are approaching, um, you know, going through the holiday season, 
the preparation stage. So people listening and thinking about their New Year's resolution are intending to take action like within the next 30 days, and you might have already started making some of those actions. But here's the thing, once you get in that action stage, you know, unless you make it to that six month stage where then you becomes maintenance, it's really hard to keep it up. So Roger's already given you some tools and Teresa and I are going to add a few more that you might wanna to add to your toolbox to help uh, make those changes in the new year stick. So with the trans theoretical model, you know, it talks a lot about pros and cons. And a lot of times people have had their list, what's, why do I want to change? How am I gonna go about it? Well, maybe I don't want to, maybe there, there's something I don't wanna give up. And usually when those pros start to outweigh the cons, that's when we kind of get into the action stage. That's right, Danielle. And it, sometimes it's um, a dialogue inside of your head, like, what do I want most versus what do I want now? That's the question. So often that what I want now wins out, but very often what we want now and what we want most are contradictory, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because I Maybe know that's the tipping point when, when yeah. we really can hone in on what we want most. I don't yeah. know. What do you think? Yeah, Because then you don't have the instant gratification. You know, you don't have to yes. have the, whatever the thing is now, if you know, in the long run. So for example, someone who's trying to quit smoking or eating less sugar or whatever that it is, it's, you know, but I, I want it in the now, but do I want that for my health six months from now, a year or two years? And, and once you really hone in, then I think you can start to make that change. And I notice the other thing that I think kind of foils people is like the self-efficacy. So they may believe they can change, but when you ask people, well, what about when you're in a tempting situation? It's kind of helpful to have an if then, you know, when you're seeking out, say, social support, um, hopefully your friends are on board. But if for some reason you go somewhere and there's whatever that thing is, like you go to meet a bunch of people and everyone's drinking and you're trying not to say, um, if I go to this place and I see people drinking and I have the urge and I know I don't want to, I'm going to go over to the bar and you know, get a soda or something else, like have some kind of if then, or if I go into this restaurant and everybody's ordering this, um, you know, I'm going to be prepared because I'm going to have a snack before I go. So I don't overeat or just kind of have some little engineered changes in place for when that happens. And then do some, I would say, environmental engineering. Um, for us, it's simply not having all the cookies and candies in the house and putting mm -hmm. a bowl on the table. You know, it's, if it's not there, it's for me to look at and think about, I'm not going to absentmindedly reach my hand in and grab some candy. That's just a, just a, for instance. And the last thing, and again, I'm not going to go deeply into say the smart model of change that comes from George Duran, who was a consultant and a former director of corporate planning. And it's a great model for change, but what's important kind of reiterates what, what Roger spoke about earlier taking that small kites and step and make that step measurable. So for example, um, how will I know I've succeeded? And that success might be, I did go to that event. Everybody was doing the thing that I didn't want to do, whether it was eating a certain thing or drinking a certain thing. And I didn't do it. And I went home and that is a success. And it's a time success. Like I, I can measure it and it's happened. So give yourself something small have an indicator for when you've succeeded. And if you need to, when you want to do it by, because if you just sent some random never expiration date, it's a little bit harder than when you set little tiny goals along the way. And I'm sure Teresa's got some really great stuff to add to that. Absolutely. Dan and, and Danielle, if it's a, if it's a goal around, I want to be, I want to be more kind, for example, then, then measurability, how do you know when you get there becomes a little bit trickier, but, um, but not insurmountable, right? Probably, probably things could still be measured. Random acts of kindness might be one way to measure um, the kindness that a person feels inside of them. For example, do you have other thoughts about that? I do too. And that, those are really great, but sometimes it's just taking a breath. So uh, for people, 